welcome to episode 127 of the How Did It Happen podcast hosted by Mike Malatesta. In this episode, Mike welcomes Dan Zawacki, who created Lobstergram at 24 years old with only $1,000. Today, Dan is a professional certified traction and EOS implementer at Fourmores with a passion for teaching, facilitating, and coaching business owners and their leadership teams on how to get the most out of their companies and live a better life. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show today. As you heard in the introduction, I've got Dan Zawacki with me. Dan, thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, thank you so much for inviting me. Glad to be here. I uh, We owe this, each of us owe this to Justin Breen, who, um, uh, like he does with a lot of people, put the two of us together. So Justin, shout out to you. Thank you for the introduction to Dan and and hopefully Dan will say vice versa for that when we're done. Vice versa for that. When we're there, we go. Yeah, see, he's, he's trained. He's, he knows <laughs> he's exactly what to I've do. been married for twenty-five years, <laughs> <laughs> and thirty for me. So yeah. Um, so Dan, I start every one of my shows with the same question, and that is, how did it happen for you? How did it happen for me? How did I become a lobsterpreneur? Is the question. So that is the question. I start, yeah, Lobsterpreneur, that's a good one, isn't it? That's a good one, yeah. That should be a book, Lobsterpreneur, yeah. I think the Wall Street Journal actually uh, coined that phrase. I can't remember for sure, but I've always, uh, on my LinkedIn profile, I put former Lobsterpreneur of Lobstergram. And so how it happened for me is a strange story, right? There's there's two types of entrepreneurs, right? They're the ones that actually think of an idea and a business and then, you know, they just go for it. And then there's me, the accidental entrepreneur. And so I worked in Peoria, Illinois, of uh, all the places, and that's where I started Lobstergram. And people always freak out. So I worked for a big company, Honeywell, Fortune 50. I had like just this great job. And uh, there was this new thing coming out, uh, the computers that actually would run uh, commercial buildings, which now is like mainstream. But at that point, it was crazy that you could have a computer that was as big as, you know, my table here, my desk. And I, uh, my contracts would always come up in like January. So I always gave really uh, cool gifts to my clients. And then I started uh, taking them out for dinner. And I always say, where do you want to go? And they always would want to get lobster. I was like, fine, I love lobster. And so basically, I would take them out for uh, lobster dinners. And, and, you know, when I had like 10, 15 clients, it wasn't a big deal. And this is back in the, uh, this was like 86. So uh, when you went out for lunches and dinners, you know, nobody had a glass of wine. You know, everybody's drinking Jack and Cokes. And I, it was just, it was a party. It was a different day. Yeah, it certainly was. And being, you know, 23-ish at the time, you know, you could, you could do it. But as I got more clients, you know, when I got a couple years later, I had like 40 clients. So literally my whole November and December were taking people out. So it I mean, it was fun, right? You're in your 20s. But I decided, I go, there's got to be something else that I can do. You know, I'm going to send them lobsters for a dinner. So uh, I uh, basically had a friend in uh, Boston who worked at Honeywell, and he sent me the yellow pages. And for all you kids out there before the internet, there was this big thing that had all the businesses in it. And, and uh, it was like three inches thick. And he sent it to me from uh, Boston and I was in Peoria. And I literally uh, called, there's like 24 lobster dealers uh, out in Maine and Massachusetts. I called each one of them and I said, I want to send out, uh, I think it was 80 something lobster dinners. I want two lobsters with lemon and butter and some shell crackers and bibs uh, and, you know, send it to my clients around, uh, basically it was uh, mid-state Illinois. 
And the, every single one of them said, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to do that, all right? And I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm just gonna give you like an order for 80 of them. You know, how stupid could this be? They were, they would not even give me a price to do it. That's how, that's, uh, that's how stupid they thought it would. <laughs> just a flat out, get it, no way, get out of here. Yeah. No yeah. way, man. This is stupid. We're not going to waste our time. So finally, this one guy, he's like, well, I won't do it. He goes, but I'll, you know, send you the lobsters. I'll send you 200 pounds of lobsters, which was about 160 lobsters, something like that. And I'll send them to Peoria. And then you can do whatever you want with them. So I thought to myself, oh, all right. You know, I'll spend like three, four days and just go around playing Santa Claus delivering lobsters. So if you can just take this as a visual, here I am with my, my company car. I've got uh, a blue tarp laying in the, the back in the trunk with, and I took all the lobsters out of the box, like 180 lobsters freaking crawling all around. You know, I'll click, 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 click. Luckily it was cold enough uh, where they could survive but it wasn't cold enough where they would freeze like, you know, solid. I had no idea how to keep a live lobster alive. So I was, there was one of the first things, just pure luck that that worked. And then I, I went and got a bunch of jewel bags, the plastic bags, and I uh, bought cases of lemon and butter. And uh, then I had some little bows that I would put on there and a little card that I'd write, hey, thanks for your business, it was fun golfing, or you know, something about it. And I'd open up the trunk of my car, put two lobsters in a bag with a stick of butter and a lemon and the card and stick the bow on it. And I'd go up there, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo, go right to their office, say hey, and you know, just give them this bag and they would literally go, oh, wow, thanks, Dan. And then I'd say, well, open it. And they open it up and they'd be like, Oh my God, <laughs> are these live? I go, yeah, they are. See you later. Got to go. <laughs> yeah, that's a lasting impression. You talk about, uh, I called it FUM, fun, unique, and memorable. That was, uh, that was my, uh, I didn't, that was my marketing at the time because I didn't know anything. So literally, that's what I did. And I did it for, I think it was like three days. So. It was really fun. I, you know, I drove from my territory is Peoria to uh, Champaign Urbana to Deca or Decatur down to Springfield. A lot of clients in Springfield, and so it was. It was so much fun. I mean, and of course, I had about ten lobsters that just were leftovers for myself, and so made lobster dinner for my uh, my girlfriend and myself. So that was fun. And I started getting uh, phone calls and actually letters from people saying thank you. That was like one of the coolest uh, gifts that they've gotten. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, nobody ever called me and thanked me before. That's pretty cool. So this one guy, Larry Fletcher, who worked for the Department of Corrections, he's like, Dan. He goes, that was fantastic. He goes, my wife loved it. I loved it. It was so unique. And he goes, my wife wants to start a company. Are you going to do anything with that lobster thing? And I looked back and I said to him, I go, yeah, I'm writing a business plan right now. And I had not even thought about doing anything. But I was like, wow, if this guy, here's my men, like a mentor, thinks it's a great idea. Well, then I should at least think about doing something. So that night at my little studio apartment, I started, I wrote a business plan, which was, <laughs> it's the shortest business plan in the history of life. It was uh, 18 things to do. That's what I actually called it, my to-do list. And number one was, how do you ship live lobsters <laughs> across the country? Number two was like, where do you get live lobsters? <laughs> uh, and then I had some really cool ones. One was like, what are my KPIs that I need to review? 
which I was really impressed at. I was like, wow, I yeah. knew what I was talking about. I had my business degree. And so it was funny too, even one was how do credit, it was literally, I said, how do credit cards work? Because to me, it was magic you, that someone could give you these numbers over the phone and magically they would appear inside your, um, your bank account. And that's how green I was. I didn't know anything. No one, I was an entrepreneur in my family. None of my friends, parents, nobody was. Um, so after I did these 18 different to-dos, got them, cheap, check them off. I'm like, holy cow, you know, this is, this is cool. Came up with the name Lobstergram, um, which is an interesting story in itself. Yeah, I was going to ask you what about other names you considered before you came up with with Lobstergram. You know, I don't even remember because this one, I was literally driving from Springfield to my house in Peoria, and I and I looked up in the sky because I drove literally almost fifty thousand miles a year, so I was a lot of drive, a lot of windshield time, and there in the clouds was like. I saw the claws and the head of a lobster. And all was, and I, there was no illegal substances or drinking involved. This just came up and saw it. And all of a sudden I went, oh, lobster gram. And then that was it. Boom, done. Yeah. And then I did a trademark uh, search and it was available. So I trademarked it. And then I came up. That was the first, you know, kind of like omen thing. Like, okay, wow, this is it. Second one was, I was thinking of a really cool 800 number. So I went 1-800-LIVE-LOB. And nobody answered it. I'm like, oh my gosh. No, I don't know what that means. So I called AT&T and said I wanted 1-800-548-3562. And they said, okay. And I got it. I was like, this can't be this easy. <laughs> so let me just interrupt you for a second because you... <laughs> This is an amazing story. So first of all, you, you're you're basically trying to scale up your lobster dinners with clients, right? So you're like, how can I, how can I, sort of make make um, more time for myself and still give these people the experience, right? Exactly. You, you, <laughs> this is why I love entrepreneurs. So you, at the whole time you were telling the story about getting the 200 pounds of lobster, putting them in your, the trunk of your car, going door to door and delivering them. I'm thinking to myself, okay, that's a one and done for me. Like by the time I got done with it, I'd be like, what the hell did I come up with that idea for? And <laughs> you, on the other hand, are like, this is working. <laughs> this is really cool. Maybe I could make a business out of this. Well, yeah. And uh, it turned out, it turned out to be quite a great business. And, um, but it was it was really fun. So the, the first, I'm, so I'm still trying to work at Honeywell, right? Cause you don't want to kill the golden goose. Yeah. It certainly wasn't like now you could almost get any type of food, uh, through, you know, the internet. But back then it was Harry and David, Omaha steaks and Hickory farms. And that was it. And I, you know, was like, okay, well, Maybe there's a market for it. So I went to the, now this is crazy, the old county morgue building in Peoria, Illinois, that they were converting into, this thing was like 1850s. They were converting it into an answering service. Because I'm like, well, if I'm, be, if I'm working all day at Honeywell, I'm going to need someone to answer the phones. So I talked to the guy. And uh, he's like, oh, yeah, we'll take care of your phones. And uh, I said, you wouldn't by chance know anybody who has any uh, warehouse space. And he's like, oh, yeah, I got 2,000 square feet uh, in the basement where the old embalming tables are and the refrigerators, you know, where they put the bodies. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I go, uh, you want to show it to me? And it's exactly what you would think something built in the 1850s would look like. And... Um, it was kind of spooky. It was spooky. This is in the middle of the day. So we go down there and I needed a space. And uh, I go, well, how much do you want for this? And he goes, oh, how does $50 sound? And I was like, 
sounds pretty good. <laughs> so I got for 50 bucks, I got 2000 square feet. And uh, so that's the old embalming tables is where I use my to pack the lobster packages because by now I figured it out. I put a cooking pot in there, a candle with a little uh, glass candle holder. I put matches in it and mm -hmm. the shell crackers, the bibs, the forks, of course, the lobsters, the instructions. So I, it, it kind of now formed into just two lobsters and a jewel bag into a, a nice gift. And so I needed to pack it all up. And um, so that was where my first uh, warehouse quote unquote was. <laughs> and you did that, you did the, that like nights and weekends or something when you were first? So I was one of the top salespeople at Honeywell. Uh, There's like 500 in my division. So I was one of those guys where I was just good at it. And I was, I did what every sales manager tells you not to do. Don't go after the one big giant sale. Cause if you don't get it, your whole year is going to be gone. Yeah. But I always went after the one big giant sale <laughs> and I would get it like in July and I'd make my whole year. And my quota was the highest one. My quota was higher than guys in New York. And this is in Peoria. Hmm. So I had a lot of free time after, you know, cause back in the day, if you made your quota, you could, you were like gold. So I would work, you know, take off around two o'clock, go to the, uh, the, to the answering service, get the orders and then go pack them, take them down to the UPS facility. Uh, and yeah, I might have two, three orders a day. I remember one time I had five orders and I just thought, Oh my God, I am the coolest five orders. I just made like a hundred dollars. And uh, so I basically um, just worked it out of there and um, it just, but they, I would call them, they were mercy sales. Most of them were friends, business colleagues, uh, of course, relatives, people that kind of felt sorry for me. Uh, you know, all oh, this guy, he's, he's an entrepreneur, but Nobody's really buying anything, so <laughs> we'll throw them a bone and send, get them an order. So, you know, scaling was definitely something I realized I had to do. And um, so I went on uh, Jonathan Brandmeier and uh, Johnny B. Johnny B. Yeah. My idol. And uh, I just basically called him thinking, okay, like he was the number one pretty much guy in, in the country just about. And everybody listened to him. So I called up the, the loop, the radio station, thinking, you know, it's going to be voicemail hell. And his producer, I, I get through the operator, I can get to Jimmy Budd, his producer. Remember Jimmy Budd? I do, yeah. And so he's, you know, I t I'm telling him what I do. And he goes, Wait a second. So you ship live lobsters out of Peoria, Illinois to people around the country. And I said, yeah. He goes, all of a sudden, I, I, he muffles the phone and I hear him go, hey, Johnny, you got to get on the line. There's this lobster guy from Peoria on. And so he gets on the line and he asks me questions. And I, you know, my heart's like pounding because this is my idol. And um, so he says, hey, can you come on the show Friday? And this was like on a Tuesday. I go, oh my God, for sure. And he goes, but you got to give three lobster grams away to the listeners. I'm thinking, wow, all right, that's a pretty good deal. So ended up uh, getting on his show. And what I did is on the little checkout board, you know, where you're going to go, I said I was going to make in cold calls in Springfield, Illinois that day. Oh, this is at Honeywell, you mean? Yeah, yeah, at okay. Honeywell. Your Honeywell checkout board, okay. Honeywell checkout board. <laughs> All of a sudden, you're on Johnny the Brandmeier. <laughs> Peoria, I don't think, who's going to, you know, <laughs> number one guy, right? There's a Honeywell office in Chicago. But what happened is my boss's boss was in a taxi, and the, the taxi driver was listening to uh, Johnny B, and he heard me on the radio saying that, 
I don't even remember it, but I said I used to work at Lob or uh, I used to work in Honeywell, and now I'm shipping lobsters around called Lobstergram, and I told them how it started. And um, so, anyways, I literally call my answering service, and the owner starts just bitching me out. He's like screaming at me because I've just flooded all their lines for two hours, and. He's pissed because, you know, he's all these other people and no one can get through. And in the meantime, I'm just like going, oh, my God, yes. So it ended up I had 160-some orders from just that. I was on for 10 minutes or something, which was a crazy amount of time to be on his show. And I was on for 10 minutes, sold 160. And I was like, holy cow, proof of concept. I'm going to do this. So I drive back to Peoria. And I go to the office, trying to act semi-normal, because, you know, I'm kind of freaking out with excitement. And there, my boss, as soon as I walked in the office, he's like, Zawacki, get your ass in my office right now. And I'm thinking, oh, man, who narked on me? You know, how, how did he find out? Well, he turned out, you know, that his boss heard about it, called me. So back then, uh, I had signed a piece of paper saying that I would spend all my time with Honeywell and wouldn't do anything outside. You know, it's not like the gig economy now. Yeah. Okay. And so you know, even though I was like, they basically enslaved you to work. If you're going to work here, you're only working here. Yeah, that was exactly it. Yeah. Okay. Even though I was literally one of the top salespeople in the country, so I got the box. Had to get my car keys. Had to call a taxi to get back to my apartment. And I was done. Uh, I was over. No more Honeywell. And I just remember I'm in tears. Call my mom because they live in Chicago. Call my mom and dad. Tell them I just got fired. And, uh, you know, I never got fired on anything before. And so my mom's like, Oh, honey, that's okay. You can come live uh, up, you know, at your, and stay in your old bedroom, and that can be your office. And then we'll get your dad to pull his car in the driveway, and you can have half the garage as your warehouse. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, hey, things are looking up. This is this is this is great. So now I move to Chicago, live with my parents again, have my old bedroom, <laughs> which I turn into my office. And I actually, I needed a lobster tank because, well, to keep live lobsters alive, you need a lobster tank. And I literally was driving around, this is, an, I'll never forget this day, this, even though this is 35 years ago, Mundelein, Illinois, a restaurant called Dover Straits. And I'm just driving around because I'm trying to figure out, okay, I don't have any income. I don't even have a business plan except a to-do list. And as I'm driving by this restaurant, I look over and there is a lobster tank on the side of the, of the restaurant. I immediately stop, talk to the owner. He said, like, yeah, it's been sitting there for a couple of years. He goes, you could have it for like 50 bucks. So I reach in my pocket, I got 35. I go, how about 35? He goes, okay. So I gave him 35 bucks, got the lobster tank, plugged it in, had a couple of leaks, but plugged them up with a little silicone. And it worked. And then I found uh, somebody in Chicago, Chicago Fish House, that would I could go buy lobsters from. And so then I started uh, just shipping them out. And I garbage picked a freezer because you needed a freezer to freeze the blue ice, the packs, right? Because dry ice wouldn't work. And it's like all these weird things that just, you know, just clicked and I just kind of happened. And so that's why I, I say I was like a, the accidental entrepreneur. I, I just things happened. So a couple questions for you. The when you were working out of the basement of the morgue, did you not have a lobster tank there, or were you just using refrigeration there? Uh, so every day I would go to this local fish market and pay retail for the lobsters. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Got it. And then, so it's just in time inventory. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, just in time without 
That was probably the first one to come up with just 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 in time inventory. Right. Okay. All right. So um, as you were telling the story, and I told you this when we were talking one time before, but when I was talking to you the first time or the second time we met before we went on, I was like, Lobstergram. I'm like, did you, as I grew up in the um, Philadelphia area, and I was like, Lobstergram, man. Were you, did you, were you on the Howard Stern show? And, um, and, and, and then when you, and it turns out you were, and then, uh, or, you know, you, you advertised there. And then when you mentioned Johnny B, I had forgotten about that. But when I moved here uh, and started, started my, my waste business, I was driving a lot <clears throat> into Chicago all the time. So I would always be listening to Brandmeier. And when you said live lob, 1-800-LIVE-LIVE, it brought back so many memories of like connecting all those things together. Because um, it's something you don't forget. Like a lobstergram is something you just, an advertisement for lobstergram is something you, you don't forget. And think about that. That was 35 years ago. I know. And I still remember it. Like fondly. You know, it just, it just happened that way, uh, which is really cool. So when did you move out of your, when did you move out of your mom's house and really get this business going? My dad said, "This is hilarious." They go, "You have six months to make this wacky idea work. Otherwise, you know, you're going to pay rent and you have to get a real job." So there was a lot of pressure, and so my next warehouse, uh, literally, I bought a three flat in Chicago. Uh, up in the northwest side by Saganosh area. It was kind of a dump, uh, but that's what I was looking for. A three foot flat paid a hundred grand for it. And I lived in one of the, the top floor, uh, rented out the middle one, and the lower one was now the new Lobster Graham World Headquarters. And there was a two car garage in the back so now I have 50% more capacity. I have a two car garage and I was there for probably three years and I could get out uh, about 40 packages a day there. And uh, most of the time I was doing about 15, 20 a day. Um, and then I outgrew the garage and got a, what I call a real warehouse in um literally right down the street from where i was at just out of pure luck and again accidentally um called a friend of mine up an attorney said you know where any space is at and he goes yeah i got this space that's in this kind of weird area that nobody really knows about gave me the address and i said i'll be down there in 60 seconds uh, <laughs> i go that's literally three blocks from where i was living hmm. And so it had uh, 4,000 square feet of office space and 4,000 square feet of warehouse space. And so then I, I actually built a big lobster tank there and a, a free, huge freezer. You could fit like uh, 15 pallets in because by that time I started doing surf and turfs because people really loved surfing, you know, this combination. And I was doing crab legs and chowder and some desserts and started just expanding uh, out a little bit. Were you still buying locally and then just turning it around and selling it through your, as a package or through as a lobster gram? I was ordering from um, uh, the lobster dealers in Maine. Okay. And picking them up at the airport, uh, eh, like maybe a couple times a week. Because if, if your tank was running, they could live in there for weeks. Uh, but of course you never, you always wanted to turn your inventory, especially live inventory. You want to turn that pretty quick. <laughs> how did you figure out then, uh, how to ship the, how to ship it so that they, you know, showed up alive? Was that challenging or was that easy? No. So <laughs> no, it, it was pretty tough to do. So I thought that, uh, I was going to use dry ice. And uh, so I'll, I put, I didn't even use a uh, styrofoam cooler. I just put it in a box, two live lobsters and a five pound block of dry ice. And I sent it to a friend of mine in Florida. 
And he said when it arrived, of course, the dry ice, you know, sublimed, melted. Uh, but before it did that, it releases carbon dioxide, killed the lobsters probably within 30 seconds after I closed it, and then froze them solid, shipped it where they thawed out, and just smelled really bad. So that I learned was not a good way to do it. And uh, then when I got my first order from a dealer, uh, they put it in a styrofoam cooler with those blue pack, blue gel packs and seaweed. So I just bought smaller um, uh, coolers. They're not called styrofoam, it's polystyrene. It's a much denser material. And so I would put the uh, blue ice in there, the lobsters there, and then the uh, uh, seaweed that came with the lobsters on top of it, and that kept them nice and warm. And then I had a uh, box that I built, and on top of the box, I put the lobster pot, or on top of the cooler, the lobster pot, the lemon, the butter, the bibs, and all that stuff went on it. And that was called the Lobster Gram Deluxe. That was the name, the Lobster Gram Deluxe. <laughs> And what does seaweed do for them? And just out of curiosity. Well, they live in the seaweed, any, I mean, in the ocean. Yeah. But what the seaweed does is it retains the moisture. The lobsters, actually, their gills slash lungs are 40% effective out of water. So they can literally live for 48 hours out of water, uh, breathing air. And But it has to be moist. If it's, if it's not... And, the, and that's what the, uh, the uh, seaweed did. And of course, the was also ocean water because uh, fresh water is lethal to a, you know, salty creature. Okay. So this is an amazing story that a guy in Peoria and then Chicago is basically the lobster gram, the lobsterpreneur of the world. Um, and the products coming from... <laughs> from Maine to Chicago and then going back out to all of these people who are ordering. It's, it's like a brilliant idea. Like, who would have thought? You'd think it was coming right off the boat, right? It's like, we just caught this this morning and shipping it out. So the funny thing, you're 100% right. No, nobody ever questioned that. They, and if somebody asked me, I would say, yeah, it's out of Chicago. But mm -hmm. no one ever asked me. And eventually, though, that did kind of become an issue, right? Because people were like, wow, well, I want my lobsters from Maine. So I did buy a warehouse in Maine and made the world's first just lobster delivery to the home market warehouse, which was a whole big deal in itself because there was no blueprints. There was no, no one I could talk to and how to do it. So I just bought this big square right in just north of the border, right where all the lobsters are. And I remember going there with just rolls of duct tape and I would duct tape out where my freezer would be. And I had two docks. And so I would just imagine here would be the forklift unloading stuff. It would go like this. And then I outlined in uh, what my uh, conveyor, I needed a conveyor belt by then because we were doing a hundred, 200, sometimes 2,000 packages a day. Um, and so literally it was a conveyor belt that would move. You know, one station, you drop the, uh, the, the polystyrene cooler in. Next one would be ice packs, the lobsters, and just kept going. And then it would go through this shrink wrap tunnel or shrink it and then get loaded on a pallet. And, and then UPS uh, would, uh, they park a trailer right there for us and we'd load up the trailer. Uh, my record, I think we did 137,000 packages in one year, which was crazy when I think back about, you know, how hard it was for me to do five packages in a day. And did you, before I, <clears throat> before I forget about this, any health department concerns or anything when you're in the morgue or in the, your parents' garage or the lower level of the flat, the, uh, the lower level of this... <laughs> Well, let's say I didn't really uh, apply for any permits. Okay. 
Uh, so you were like an ask for forgiveness if that became necessary sort of approach? I was always very good at that. Yeah. But now in Maine, that's a really good qu uh, question because in Maine, you know, I had to get building permits and all these kind of things. And uh, yeah, we were FDA. Uh, I owned that for about 15 years. So the FDA came um, and uh, there was also a division of Maine. Uh, I called them the green police uh, because they wore green uniforms and they had nine millimeter pistols and they would make sure that your lobsters were of legal size. And oh, they, okay, sure, yeah. Yeah, usually they were out on boats, but they didn't know what to do with me because I was shipping them out. So all of a sudden they'd come up unannounced and you'd, you'd like go, you know, raise your hands because you'd be like, oh my God, what's <laughs> happening here? Um, so, so you grow, so you start, <laughs> so you start out, you start with this first load in your, in your, the trunk of your car. Um, you go to the morgue, you go to your parents' house, you go to a, a warehouse, you get a warehouse in Maine, you, you end up building the business to like 15 million bucks in sales, I think, which is, it's a lot of lobster. Like you said, 137,000 packages in your busiest year. How did you grow that? Was it, I mean, you, you talked about being on, on Bram Meyer's show that sort of got you started, but, but you became really a, a marketing genius. And I'm wondering how that, what you did and how it all came together for you, because it's, it, it just seems very novel and impressive, at least for that time. Yeah, because there's nobody to copy off of. Right. Uh, so uh, let's just say I threw a lot of shit at the wall to see what would stick. Okay. But I was actually pretty good at marketing. And I, uh, I learned that my niche was radio. Okay. And that it was live reads that were really the key. Active listeners on conservative talk shows. So that that was my, what I tell my clients these days, that's find your gold, that was my gold. Uh, talk show hosts that were conservative that would do a live read. And of course I'd always give them free lobster grams that you know, they could give out to their listeners, which I would get an extra little plug out of that deal. And so we were doing uh, with Sean Hannity. And I was his first national advertiser, which is crazy to even think about that on radio. Yeah. Uh, now, Howard Stern didn't quite fit that conservative talk show host uh, model, but he was a big fan. And when he would do like the 60 second live reads, he'd go on sometimes for four minutes. Uh, he was a uh, Baba Booey and Robin, everybody who knows them, they all became, you know, clients and customers. Uh, let's see, Glenn Beck uh, was real popular. Rush Limbaugh uh, worked really great. Did you ever, did you ever try to get Trump? Uh, no, never tr got Trump. Um, although we did have a lot of famous people that uh, were Lobstergram customers, okay. uh, which was pretty cool. Um, but that was really, and then I also put on a 48-page a catalog, which was just beautiful, you know, just fantastic uh, photos. So, you know, people eat with their, you know, their minds, right? They don't care about text. So we did a lot of lifestyle photos. There was this thing back then in like 85 called, uh, or 95 called uh, the World Wide Web. So I, I thought I might try that. And uh, I think I read somewhere that you had the first Google AdWords. Yes, we were the first. <laughs> Nobody believes this. That sounds, yeah, it's, it sounds like it couldn't even possibly be true. Yeah, I have the internal document from Google about it. So literally, I mean, you know, back then it was free. And so my marketing guy, he's like, Hey, I just read in the trade magazine that they're going to be start doing, you know, 
uh, where, you know, you can buy keywords on Google. And he said, we should do it. And I said, we get it for free. Why would we want to do that? And he goes, because they can't keep doing it for free. Hmm. So yeah. we bought the word lobster, which is the worst word you could ever buy, probably, for a nickel. And, uh, oh, my gosh, we ended up spending eventually sometimes $25,000 a month in Google AdWords. And that just became over half of our sales. Uh, so between that and the radio, and then we were really great at customer service. So we treated our customers like gold. So we had a very high uh, reorder rate which is the key to any business, right? Sure, recurring. So, uh, and one of uh, the things is I always wanted to get the best lobster and steak because uh, there's different grades of lobster, just like, you know, there's prime steak, there's select choice. So we always got the best quality. So, you know, with that people, um, you know, they always came back. And word of mouth was the, no, we, we always checked everything. Word of mouth, no matter, I was spending $750,000 a year on radio, but word of mouth was the number one, uh, you know, thing that people ordered from. You know, it was like someone would get one and they'd be talking around the water cooler at work the next day and poof, those people would go out and order, call up and say, hey, I need to press, I need to send this gift too. And we were really good. We, we became good at gifting. I learned that was our niche, right? And that we kind of finalized uh, that our niche was gifting. Um, I was one of the first people to actually do gift certificates. Uh, I still have like one of the original gift certificates I would write by hand. Good for one lobster gram deluxe. All they had to do was send that in or tell you tell tell you they had it when they placed the order or something. They had to they had to give the number, which was so bad because I started at one thousand and one. The next one was one thousand and two. The next one was one thousand and three. I mean it was so easy to crack the code. Sure. Eventually though, we did random numbers when we got to a certain level. But so so you were one of the first internet marketers, really. With the, yeah. with the AdWords and stuff. And you, I think you told me that uh, QVC was a big part of your um, marketing as well. Did you mention that? Matter or? of fact, um, I have the largest TV lobster sales record in history. $2.5 million in one day on QVC. Oh off qvc yeah one day it was unbelievable <clears throat> so what <laughs> so my question is going to be like why wouldn't you do that every day <laughs> maybe well you they had this thing was well, i still have it it's today special value so they do one company you know a day and believe me every company in the whole country wants it to be on that yeah, and so okay. we, we did it. But I was on QVC about 60 to 80 times a year for almost 10 years. And uh, that was crazy. That, that was almost a third of our business. And did you get on QVC by just picking up the phone and calling like you did with Brandmeier show or some of the others? Or how did you? Yeah. I just called them up and I asked them to talk to their food buyer. And uh, they gave me the food buyer and I just winged it and they said, all right, well, we're not going to do live lobsters, but you know, we'll do tails. Cause by that time we expanded into lobster tails. Okay. And, um, so I went out the, out there and gave them my pitch. I actually literally made them lobsters, uh, for lunch. I figured that's a, that, that's a great sales presentation. So I'm giving my pitch while they're all eating lobster. <laughs> How could they say no? Right. Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, so what? I need your expertise here to sort of settle something. So a lot of people, a lot of people think. Well, a lot of people don't really know what to do with a lobster, even today, right? They don't. They don't know how to eat it. They don't know how to cook it. They don't know how to 
pick it, right? Yeah. So um, I've always been taught, my wife is from Connecticut, and, and you know, we, we have lobsters often, but I, and I've always been taught that smaller lobsters, pound and a quarter or so, are the best lobsters. Bigger lobsters, you don't want to buy a big lobster. Now, I, I, I have confirmation bias on that because that's what I've been taught. What's your, what's your, what's your professional opinion about that? Having sold more lobsters than anybody that I'll ever know. Well, uh, let's just say your wife is mistaken. Okay. The reason why that most people think that is because when, you know, you have a, a cooking pot, right? It's my, be 12 or 16 quarts at the most. So what happens when you have a bigger lobster, it has a tendency, you know, water boils, put the lobster in, stops boiling. You have a tendency not to cook it all the way or worse, overcook it where it gets real tough. Mm. And that's usually what most people do. They say, oh, the bigger lobsters, you know, they're, they're tougher because, you know, it takes the time for the water to get back up to the boil, but it's still cooking. So if you don't take that into account, you're going to overcook it. So I had a, uh, we did a, uh, a cover shot for uh, Fortune magazine, right? They said, Dan the Lobster Man, get the biggest lobster you can, and that's what we're going to, you know, put for the story. So I called, you know, one of my lobster friends, fishermen, said, you know, what, what's the biggest lobster you got? He goes, well, I got two, I got a 20 pounder and a 21 pounder right now. I don't know if you've ever seen one, but it's massive, right? I mean, the tail alone is, is like you're eating a roast. And so I went out and bought a uh, 25 quart, a hundred gallon pot for a restaurant and this giant burner and cook those lobsters and because we had so much water, the lobsters just cooked up, boiled them, did the photo shoot. And of course, you know, you've got 40 pounds of lobster. What are you going to do, right? You're not going to throw it out. So we opened it up and we made lobster rolls for everyone in the office. And everybody got to take like pounds of lobster meat. And they were just fantastic because we cooked them. So from my experience, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how big, it's how big of a pot you have. How big of a pot. Okay. And you said boil. So you're a boil, not steam. Ah, boil, steam them, put them on the grill. Doesn't matter to you. Okay. I've um, done it always. The key though is what I learned is to make sure you have great, um, instructions on how to, like you said, pick the meat, you know, how do you take the meat out of the arms, the claw, the you know, all that. Um, and so we spent a lot of time making sure that we uh, had great instructions on there. As a matter of fact, I was one of the first people to do videos um, on YouTube on how to cook lobster. Okay. Um, which is pretty cool. And you learned that, uh, you learned that after the trunk load of lobster delivery thing i'm assuming right you because you were eating them at restaurants or were you cooking lobster before like before you even started uh i didn't have the budget to eat a lot of lobster back in the day uh once a year my parents would break down and get me some lobster uh but what i did learn was that we when you have your own lobster tank uh let's say you have 100 lobsters in there you're going to have one or two floaters, we call them, that perished over the night. And they're in, uh, the water's 38, 40 degrees, so they're fine. And so we would, that's how I learned how to cook them. And uh, okay. The best way. And then I would go out to Maine a couple times, a couple times, oh my God, a couple times a month and go on the boats with the fishermen. They would give me, you know, their tricks of the trade and um, so I really learned how to do it. In fact, one time I did this, um, contest, uh, where I literally took all the meat, I was blindfolded and I took all the meat out of a lobster in 38 seconds, cracked it, took it all out, blindfolded. 
that's hard to do when you're looking at it just for people who don't have a uh, ha, don't have a way to contextualize that <laughs> it's not easy well i got i ate a lot of lobster i'm sure you did yeah oh and crab and steaks oh my gosh i mean i ate for 30 years i ate like a king yeah and it's good for you too the irony by the way the irony by the way of you talking about you know practicing cooking on the on the floaters and having started in a morgue is, is isn't lost on me i'm just going to tell you that right now that's funny i never <laughs> thought of that that's a good one so so you, 30 years of doing this you you made a huge business out of it and then you decided to to sell the business um and then you you pivoted and we have about 10 minutes to go here and i'm i'm interested in you um sharing with us you know kind of what went into the decision to to sell the business because boy you sound like you're you know well you are the lobster man right and yeah. you, you end up selling the business and and then and you pivot into a new business yeah so it was it was two things actually number one was 30 years is a long time to do anything hmm. and i found myself probably around the 25th year not being as excited about it. Um, just one of the things I've, I've learned now is I wasn't loving my, my people, my employees like I used to. And, and I had 127 employees during Christmas too. So uh, it was a lot of issues, but nonetheless, um, one, so in 2016 of Christmas, we um, had, uh, I bought too much inventory and we didn't sell it all. And so the bank basically said, okay, you need to pony up uh, the line of credit. We need you to put in a significant chunk of money. And I'm like, what are you crazy? I'm not, I don't want to do that. So talk to my wife about it. And she's like, well, you haven't really been excited about your company for a while. And of course, as a wife, she's always right, which she was. Mm -hmm. So I decided I was going to sell it. And I thought it was going to take a long time to do it. Uh, took like 100 days, sold it. Uh, just, I don't know, lucky, whatever. And in the meantime, though, I have read the book Traction from Gina Wookman. And uh, it was about, it's an operating system to run your business. Kind of like you have an operating system for computers. This is an operating system. It's called the Entrepreneur Operating System. And I read this and I just, it was like one of the best business books I've ever read in my life. It really laid it out on how to have a system to run your company. And I, try, I actually tried to implement it at Lobstergram and failed miserably because oh, I didn't want to. Yeah, I didn't want to do the hard stuff. Yeah. You know, I just picked out the easy things. And of course, my employees were all like, oh, just let him read another book and he'll come up with something else. But I knew when I decided, the day I decided to sell Lobstergram that I was going to become a uh, professional EOS implementer. And so now my company, uh, fourmores.com, we help uh, business owners, entrepreneurial business owners, just live a better life through this, through this system. And, um, it is my, you know, you said of the pivot, it was a huge pivot, but then 30 years of being in the trenches of running a business, the, the good, the bad, the really bad stuff that you don't ever want to tell anybody sure. uh, helps me uh, now with my clients. So my clients right now are anywhere between 10, 250 employees. And I just, teach them how to live a better life and run a better business. And it's just so gratifying. All my clients are my friends. Um, I just enjoy it. I feel very grateful and humble that I could find my second passion in life. You know, you know, you done, you've done this enough. How many people never find their, their first passion in life? Right. Right. And I think it's, I think it's phenomenal that you go through, this 
30 year career from startup to, you know, a really good sized business, sell the business and, and then realize that you have a lot of value to offer people because of that 30 year experience and put it back to work. Cause so many people are lost after they sell a business. They just, it's, it's, they kind of think it's who they are and without the business anymore, maybe they don't have anything to offer anybody. And you're a great example of why that's not true why that's not the case. Well, uh, yeah, I agree. Cause I have a lot of friends who've sold their businesses, right. And they're kind of lost and all they do is want to play golf all day and fish and do whatever. Well, the problem is all their friends are working, right? So <laughs> it's a little boring, but I just felt this passion that I have this gift to be able to offer other entrepreneurs. Cause let's face it. Everybody struggles at some point they hit the ceiling. And I've hit that ceiling. And now with the entrepreneur operating system, the process, it just, my clients, they tell me they love the stories about Lobstergram and how it makes so much sense applying, you know, the, the operating system to their own business. Right. And you, um, this Four Moors, the name of your company, Four, that's, that's for the, the number four, M-O-R-E-S, right? Yeah. yeah. So what does that mean? How did you, what you, since, <clears throat> since you came up with lobster gram, there has to be a really good reason why you came up with four mores. Okay. This is, a, this is, this is a great question. So I'm on the session in the session room with the client and I do everything on the whiteboard. You know, I write it out because if you can't write it out, it's probably a bunch of bullshit. That's what I always say. So I'm sitting there. I go to them. I go, look, here's what it amounts to. We're building the structure for the organization. Because if we have a solid structure, we're gonna be able to grow this thing. And if we grow it right with the right structure, you're gonna have more profit. And if you have more profit, guess what? You're gonna have more fun too. And all of a sudden I looked at it and I just said, "You, what I'm providing you is the four mores. And I looked at it and I went, oh. I turned around and I go, and if any of you little bastards take that URL by the time I go to GoDaddy, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and so I went, to, uh, went there and I, it was there, you know. And so I got it and I got a bunch of derivatives of it too. But that's it, you know, four mores. More structure, more growth, more profit, more fun. <laughs> I like it. It gets back to your F. What, is it, what was it? F U M that you used before? F U M. Yes. Fun, unique, unique, and memorable. And memorable. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I guess I always have been a marketer when it comes right down to it. Well, yeah, I'd say. I mean, <laughs> here I am, remembering stuff from when I was in my you know early to mid twenties. I mean, yeah, I'd say you're. It's sort of like, uh, like I remember the McDonald's commercial, two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, and, you know, and, and, and um, yeah, 1-800-LIVE-LOB. I remember Howard talking about it. I remember all of these things. So, yeah, you were doing some phenomenal stuff back then. My last question for you, if you were going to start Lobster, Lobstergram again in, t in today's world, how, how would you do it? That's a great question. Um, and... Actually, I have my one of my old lobster vendors that actually asked me to help them build an internet company. And so uh, a couple things. Uh, one, I would certainly be more capitalized because I only had $1,000 that I started it with. Um, and I would hire the best people. Back then, the way I hired people was Okay, wait, you have a pulse? Oh, okay, can you be on time? Can you make it by eight? Yeah, all right. You like lobster? Yeah, okay, you're hired. <laughs> and so I, I mean, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. You know, so having great people would be it. Uh, one of the things too is I might have been a little more um, focused on some of my marketing but again, back then it was different, you know, so now I know what I would do and what I would not do. Um, the processes, I was always good at making and developing processes, but I wasn't so good at following my own processes. Mm -hmm. So 
I wasn't the great at training, so I would spend more time training people. Basically, I'd say, okay, here's how you do it. You take this cooler, put the lobsters in it, put the blocks on it, put the label on it, and then get the next one. Okay. Yeah, got it? Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. So I was, I guess, just the training aspect of, of it uh, would be something that I definitely would do uh, a lot differently. And there's a lot of other things I would do differently too. But, you know, the people, the people component is one of the biggest uh, plans. And, and the other thing is I really didn't have a, a plan until about 10 years. I was just winging it every day, every day, winging it. And luckily it worked. So it took me 10 years to do my first million. And then I decided to make a plan. It was literally a two-page plan. I doubled the company that next year uh, to two million. And so having a great plan is something else that I wish I would have done earlier, but I don't know. And I probably would have started my warehouse in Maine uh, earlier because there was nothing better or more legal than paying rent to yourself. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, sure. It's like, this is legal. <laughs> yes, fair market value. Oh, all right, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about the plan when you said it, that, you know, have a great plan. But I was also thinking that if you, if you spent time on the plan when you were first starting, it probably would have scared the shit out of you. So you'd have been like, <laughs> I'm not going to do this. You know, <laughs> talk myself right out of it. You know what? You're probably right. And then I think too is being so new, I was literally, you know, you were talking about pivot. I would have to pivot almost monthly on what to do, where to do, how to. Right, right. All that. So I think if I had a plan, if I would have drove myself and all my people crazy. Well, Dan, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story. This incredible story of starting the business out of the trunk of your car or the idea, at least finding the lobster grand name in the clouds. I mean, just on and on to, and then scaling it up. So, and selling it successfully. So great, great lessons for everybody. I really appreciate it. And I, I enjoyed learning more and more about what you've done and, and congratulations on, on your new business for mores. That sounds phenomenal. And I love EOS. So, um, I'm glad that you're making the world a, any, <clears throat> a more EOS friendlier place to be and exposing more people to it. And Thank you for having me on your show. I tell you, I, I love to tell the Lobstergram story because I tell people, I go, look, if I can do that, then you can do it. And, you know, I know you start a lot of companies and I think most people, they have this idea, but they just don't have the balls to just do it, right? Or they start it and then they run into a little problem and then they stop. Right. And if you would have waited another month or another two months, who knows what would have happened. Yeah, or they expect things too fast. Like you said, 10 years to get to your first million, and then one more year you add your second million. People, you know, they think, oh, if I'm not, you know, growing huge right away, I must be doing something wrong, right? This must be the wrong thing. And businesses take time. They don't, they're not overnight success sensations. That's for sure. Well, All right, Dan. Thank you. thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the How Did Happen podcast, where we believe that success doesn't happen unless you make it happen. You can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. And while you're there, please rate it and leave a comment as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the show, ideas for future guests, or whatever you'd like to share. And of course, you can always find me at MikeMalatesta.com. See you next time. Thanks again for listening to the How Did Happen podcast. <laughs>